Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Wayne, for sponsoring me. Thank you, Gary, for asking me. You didn't ask me to speak. Yeah, it was you. It was you. Thank you, Gary. I didn't want to lie from the lectern. I've never done that before. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, who am I really, why am I up here? Why am I speaking? Well, the real reason I'm up here um, is, the real reason I'm up here is because it helps me stay sober um, and I need to keep staying sober. You know, I'm, I'm 30 years sober, but uh, apparently I'm the type of alcoholic that needs to stay sober and that needs to maintain a certain approach to life and a certain attitude to really to stay happy enough to stay sober. That's a bit of a weak way of putting it. Um, so that's, you know, so right, I'm up here, helps me stay sober, and why... Why does it help me stay sober? Because what I want to do is say something that maybe will help someone else. That's the thing. That's the real magic for me of doing this. Um, I do like the sound of my own voice. I do like public speaking. I've been paid for it in the past. If you want to make donations to me after this share, that's fine. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend it. Breaks the traditions. And I, and I, I love weaving stories. I absolutely adore it. But that's not why I'm up here. <laughs> It's not why I'm up here. The reason I'm up here is because literally I discovered something that saved my life because over the last 30 years I've seen multiple people die in agony again and again and again. And one of the most, I think in some ways the people that I most want to, to help is that is you know, we talk about sharing for the newcomer. I don't really share for the newcomer. I share for the still suffering alcoholic. I can tell I'm going to spend the first half of this share explaining how I'm going to share. But I share for the still suffering alcoholic. So it could be somebody who's, it could be someone who's new. Um, and I particularly, that, I just remember what that was like and how hard it was to go from that position of being new, cynical, unable to imagine a future for myself and Alcoholics Anonymous. So I really get that. And, and I'm so glad I broke through that barrier. I, I, I'm one of the few, the, the, you know, if you knew the statistics are against you, the chances are you're going to think we're talking a load of rubbish and you're going to walk out there and the chances are what we're saying is true and you may well drink yourself into an early grave. So, um, but then the person doing the steps as well. I, I, the only thing I ever truly completed with my heart, a hundred percent in it was the 12 steps. I knew, I knew instinctively I was, I was, uh, uh, 20, two years old, and I knew instinct, I knew I had to complete these. It was the, f uh, I'm not, there are some people who come up to the podium and speak with great certainty. I mean, I speak with passion, but I'm not one of the world's great certain people. I'm wishy-washy. I really am, very wishy-washy. But there was one thing happened to me 30 years ago that was not wishy-washy. It was the realization that if I didn't sort out my relationship with alcohol and my life, I, I, it was going to kill me. And yeah, it was going to take years. And yes, it was going to be agony because it was going to take years. It was going to be horrific. Um, and that, that was the one certainty I had sitting in an A meeting. And uh, I'm so glad. It, I was so convinced of that. I was so convinced. And what a gift to be told that at the age of 22, knowing it could be 10 years before I actually die. I knew I knew this wasn't necessarily going to happen quickly, but I knew it might. It, it was a death sentence, and it wasn't like you'll you'll have a great life and then in a decade someone will chop your head off. It was like everything you've experienced over the last five years will get worse and worse for the next ten years, and for all anyway, you get the idea. So that got me through the twelve steps. That got me all the way through the twelve steps, and when I um. So that's the other sort of person that I think of when I'm speaking up here. It was, I think, it, I, when I think back to me doing the 12 steps with my sponsor, I don't remember having a lot of, um, 
I don't remember having a lot of like other steps. I had I had the natural human insecurity. Okay, are these AAs fooling me? Am I going to be humiliated? And I, I finally, finally, I've committed to something for the first time in 22 years. I've decided myself on my own what's right for me, what I have to do. I take full responsibility for this. I give up my, all my old ideas by my choice, my decision. For the first time ever, I made, I, I total, I spent 22 years not trusting anyone and thinking I was the best and knew everything. And then suddenly, I give that all up. And I was petrified about being humiliated, frankly, that I would finish the steps and not only go through the agony of relapsing, but realize these AAs, you know, they, they were lying, basically, and it doesn't work, or it was a fluke or something. And that wasn't the case, if you knew, by the way. So, that, that, uh, in spite of, so I had that feeling. So for anyone doing the steps, you know, if you feel strong doubt and fear just about doing the steps, 100% relate. It doesn't stop them working at all, not in any way. You know, and in fact, one of the great freedoms, I can sense... He's Alexis. Self, and I'm about to go off on some rhetorical whimsy and try and impress you with my poetic constructions. But one of the great freedoms of being a human being is the freedom to act differently to how I feel and believe. And that's what I was able to do when I did the steps. I was able to act differently to how I felt and believed. And it saved me. It saved me at the age of 22. And um, so I hope, if you're new, you can do that. The steps have been a way of life for me. This, my drinking was such an embedded thing that I couldn't just do a little self-help procedure. I had to, I had to be willing to change everything I believed, everything I thought. Sounds, uh, I guess, if you're new, maybe it sounds unattractive. Maybe if you're new, you're thinking, God, please change everything I think, everything I believe. I can't bear myself. Maybe it sounds imposing. There is, but this is the truth. This is the truth. It happened to me. The basis of how I lived changed. I stopped being so chronically self-centered, and I started to try and think of others and to do things for other people. But I stayed me. So it was like a shift in the center of gravity, but I was still me. So what did I give up? Yeah, I gave up all the suffering that led me to the point of being willing to give up everything I believed to do the 12 steps. That's what I really gave up, right? And I gave up that center of gravity of just thinking, I know best of what's most important is that I make sure I'm happy and all, all of these sorts of things. Now, the steps did that for me, right? I didn't, I didn't learn somehow to be a nicer person. The steps were, as I did, as I took those actions that I didn't believe, they still worked and they changed something in me, but they kept me me, but the better me. So if you're doing the steps, I, I, I mean, the, the, I've, if I, it was a long time ago, but one of the, I remember some of the decisions I made before doing the steps, there was like, finish these steps no matter what. And the other one was do what this sponsor says no matter what. So if you're new, I offer you that tool, right? <laughs> do what your sponsor says no matter what. And uh, it worked for me. So I haven't... I, uh, I mean, I'll, this is the truth, right? It's not a flight of whimsy. I haven't had a craving to drink since 1993. <laughs> All right? I laugh because what did I just tell you about? I was convinced that my inability to stop drinking would kill me over a decade of agony from the age of 22 to 32. I haven't had craving to drink since 1992. I get confused what year it was. But anyway, it was a long time ago. I haven't had craving to drink. Gosh, isn't that amazing? If you're new, I hope that's inspired you. And if you're not, if you're not new, I do also want to share, and this is, um, I suppose the biggest thing that I would like to share if you're, if you're not new, if you're not doing it. You know, if you've got through the steps, you don't, <laughs> if you've got through the steps recently, you don't need me to tell you to stick around, right? I mean, I was like, a, talking about sticking around, I was like a limpet on AA. After I did the steps, I had such a profound psychological awakening, spiritual experience, call it what you will, at a gut level with an, an outrush of... <laughs> This is just the way it is, right? I had an outrush of love for others, and I felt joy, and I would see birds flying above Dartmoor and hear film soundtracks in my head, and it was, it was uh, but that was real, right? It was real. And what was interesting about that 
you know, if you've just done the steps and you're feeling all that. What was interesting about that is it didn't, it, it didn't turn me into someone weird. So you might think, gosh, if you became the sort of person that hears film soundtracks in your head as you see birds fly over Dartmoor and feel an outrushing of love and extreme happiness and joy, won't people think you're a bit weird? And no, actually, my friends and family were profoundly relieved. I mean, it took them a long time, I can tell you. The people that knew me as a drinker, it took them a long time to believe I'd actually changed. They prayed, well, I don't know, most of my family are atheists, but they, they hoped, they hoped that I would keep at it, and I did. And uh, so, if you've just done the steps, now I feel, and this, so that's the thing, right? Yes, there is nothing incompatible between a profound spiritual experience and a life of sane and happy usefulness, just normal, just being normal. And that's it. That's what AA can kind of offer, is this sense of being a part of things and being normal, which I had never had up to that age. I'd never understood why people thought life was beautiful. I'd always been like, once I get what I want and people understand the level of my genius and people stop hassling me and that girl will go out with me, then I will see that life is joy. You know, I, I didn't realize that that was all the stuff that was stopping me. And uh, the steps helped to reduce those cravings for uh, approval from others and for getting what I wanted all the time. So, and then, then the... But the, yes, the other person type of person I want to share for is the sort of person, um, and I was nearly this, I guess, and I don't really have a tool for you, to be honest, uh, for dealing with this problem that I'm about to tell you about. Um, and what the problem was, was a few years, and this is about 10 years into AA, I think eight years, and I, I was thinking, do I really need to do this AA? Do I really need to worry about staying in AA to stay sober? Now, it's hard to remember back to then, but I think, no, it is hard. It, there's, a, there's a vague memory in my mind that I was, I was kind of not practicing the spiritual life very well. And um, I mean, I know I wasn't practicing the spiritual life very well, right? But I vaguely remember feeling bad because I wasn't. And I think that made, I don't know, but it, 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 just, it just didn't seem worth the effort. It didn't seem worth the effort because I had no desire to drink. And it was, I, had a, I almost had this certainty, I, I never am going to drink again. But I'm still going to these meetings. I still have this sponsor. I still go to intergroup or region or whatever, you know, and it was... I was still doing all those things, and yet I had no craving to drink, and I knew, I knew I would never drink again. So why am I doing this AA? It takes up a heck of a lot of time and emotional energy, right? And uh, just imagine not having a sponsor. I'll be free! Yes! Yes, no sponsor. A free man in his 30s without a sponsor. Um, though, of course, actually, it's a free alcoholic in his 30s without a sponsor is, is, on a, is going to have an interesting time. Um, in a bad way, right? That's a euphemism. <laughs> Interesting is a euphemism for probably, well, I've seen it, unfortunately, in my brother, what happens. Um, so, so I'm sharing for that person, maybe, who's at that one of those stages in later recovery as well. Um, because you may be suffering and, and worrying and sitting in the middle of the meeting and thinking, do I really need this? Do I, is, I mean, is this all just too much effort? for what I'm getting from it when I don't really need to get all of that because I feel... So, now I made a decision, and unfortunately there's not a really cool... There's not a really cool end to this bit of the story because <laughs> all I did was I stayed, right? So what happened? I stayed. And what, what was there a light? No. Was there, was there a light? Did your sponsor hug you? No. Did anything... Nothing at all. I just didn't drink. So, so I, I, I... And this is why I stayed... I actually remember speaking to Wayne, and he didn't try and persuade me to stay. And I think he, I don't know if he quoted the big book, but I certainly quoted the big book to myself, where it had stuff about, uh, what does it say about, I don't know. Oh. I remember, it wasn't the big book, 
I remember thinking, what if the... So if, if you're new new, you're going to have to look up in, in the chapter more about alcoholism, about what I'm talking about, okay? But there is this insanity that precedes the first drink for an alcoholic of my type. So just before I drink, I forget the agony of, like, the day or the week before. It's just, oh, I'm going to have a drink. What a good idea. Um, or, oh, I'm going to have a, you know, whatever. Uh, if you're an alcoholic of my type, you're probably already thinking, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. So I thought, what if that way of thinking is not, like, time-limited? So what, you know, so you think... With me, back, what made me do the steps was even if I stayed sober for three months, usually it was one day, right? But even if I stayed sober for periods of days, weeks, or months, eventually the time would come where I think it's not such a big deal to have a drink. It's like everything would just be wiped away. You know, reboot, and like, I'm going to have a drink. And hell would result. So I thought, what if it's not just two weeks? two months, what if it could be 10 years? What if after 10 years, all the stuff that they, you know, I mean, the big book literally says, it literally says, Alexis, you know, if you stop doing this, even with many years sobriety, you will drink again. It says it. Yeah, but it's one line. <laughs> you know, but it says it, right? It's the experience, the hard-won experience of the people that wrote that book. Um, and I, I thought, well, yeah, it is just one line, but I smell a rat. I smell a rat. I think my thinking might not be as clear as I think it is. If I stay in AA, yeah, I have the sponsor. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I go to the meetings and I do my service. But what if, what if I am deluding myself, even after 10 years, that it's not such a big deal? And um, I suppose that, that there are, there are some, there, there's one horrible end to this story, which I share about to be helpful. I do not like to be dramatic and, uh, you know, I hope it doesn't take his name in vain, but my, my brother stopped coming to AA and he ended up dying. And this was many years after, but it makes me look back, and it's one of the things that makes me share this, right? Because it makes me look back to that point when I was 10 years sober and decided to stay in AA. Um, so I think he was about eight years sober when he left, or nine years sober. So it was around the same time that I, uh, around that same period anyway of time in our sobriety. So the, if you like, the sad end to that story is I, I seem to have been proved right uh, a number of times of seeing people. And I've, you know, I've got friends in this meeting who they've gone out and drunk again, or they've left AA and eventually they're drunk again. And because we're friends, I know how much they've achieved in the time they've been in AA and we've shared and we've talked. And then they come back and I'm just, I'm gutted for them. I'm gutted for them. And, uh, and I say to them, you know, what, why did you, you know, why did you drink again? And, and all that sort of stuff. Why did you stop going to meetings? You know, and uh, I learn, I learn from, from other people. The other thing that I did, you know, if you're in, oh, and this is, this is not going to be for everyone, but... I um, And I think this, what I'm going to talk about now is something that it's not about the method that I used here to kind of stay in AA. It's the, the instinct that led me to do it. So I can't remember how long I was in. This might have been 20 years. Maybe it happens every day. It comes in 10-year cycles. That sounds good, doesn't it? I have no idea how long sober I was. But I started thinking, I can't remember what this, this was a new one. This is a new one. Does an alcoholic need to stay sober for the rest of his life? You know, and not, not does my sponsor think he does, does the big book think he does, does everybody in my home group think he does? You know, does an alcoholic need to stay sober for the rest of his life? Now, the point about this, the action, so yeah, I stayed in that, you know, spoiler alert, I'm still here, right? But um, the point is, when I started thinking that, one of the biggest things that kicked in is I, um, I think, I don't know if I'd have been, I was, I've been reading things like um, Harry Tebow, who's a psychiatrist who studied the early AAs and who said that they seem to have dis oh, a distorted sense of reality and they couldn't see things clearly because 
that they, they, their view, what would happen is he called it their ego would swell up so much. This is sober alcoholics would swell up so much inside them. Their self, their chronic self centeredness, self obsession. What do they think of me? What's going to happen to me? What like me, 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 me? That it would swell up so much inside. Not only would it make them neurotic and paranoid and all that sort of thing, but it would make them see, literally believe the most compelling thought they had in their head. You know, so, so this made me think, can I trust, you know, I guess it was a similar thing to 10 years, can I trust what I'm thinking here? You know, how much of this, um, and, and what I did, so I didn't, I did a different thing, because it wasn't so much, oh, you shouldn't think that thought, Alexis. It was more, do not be impulsive, because something that Harry Tebow says he says one of the three gives three characteristics of the heavy egoed alcoholic, and one of them is they're like a kid. You let the kids out of the car, whew, they run to the park. You know, you're at the beach. You let the kids out. The ones that they can't wait to be on the beach. Right? As an adult, I kind of saunter down. You know, but kids cannot wait. I thought to myself, Alexis, it's fine that you've thought about this, but don't get into what what. And I don't know if this maybe this is just me. But whenever I have a thought that I think contradicts with my sponsor or my home group or Alcoholics Anonymous, I can get into a heck of a tizzy about it. Real, real confusion and panic. And just that, just that conflict in my head with that thought can make me leave AA. You know, so how can I... So <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of ripping off Wayne a bit here. So he talked about this like decades ago. So... But that's just the way of it, isn't it? And he, what's one way to resolve that conflict? Of like, oh, is my sponsor wrong? Is AA wrong? Is AA right? Is my sponsor right? What's one way to resolve that conflict if you can't think of a way to do it quickly and effectively through intellectual analysis or through prayer or whatever? Well, if you remove yourself from AA and your sponsor and your home group, that conflict magically seems to disappear. You've run down to the beach, right? It's, it's, and, and, that was something that I feared, was that I would make rash decisions about AA or about my sponsor or about my sobriety because of my ego, because of the Tebow ego, that, that specific thing he talked about. And so, you know, I went off on, you may be different, right? I went off on some scientific investigation reading a bunch of papers about alcoholism that uh, were published since 2015 or something, I can't remember. And uh, I discovered something rather rather depressing actually nobody had any methods for staying sober longer than about two years so it's like looking they said we have results through a combination of doo -doo -doo -doo, these people have stayed sober for 24 months well, that's not much good to me right i'm 20 years sober i might be living till i'm 75 85 whatever you know and i it, in a sense but Reading all of this, had a, it, it, it made me realize a couple of things. First of all, I still had to keep that responsibility. It was my, my sponsor could not tell me, you are an alcoholic, you must stay in AA. AA, the big book, I couldn't read that, and the words couldn't magically come out of the page and convince me. I couldn't magically open my mind and believe it, right? But what I could do is I could wait, I could pray, I could study, I could read, I could be honest with my sponsor and see what, would emerge, not like a kid running to the beach, but somebody who's making a decision about one of the most painful and agonizing and least understood diseases in the world. You know, if, if someone came to me and said, I've got alcoholism, can you recommend a non-AA way of dealing with it? I, I wouldn't know. I couldn't find any in these papers. They, they, nobody seems to, they don't seem to know that much bloody more about it now than they did in 93 when I got sober. So it's... Um, so, I had to, there's a couple of things really, I did come up with enough information to suggest that there was a class of alcoholics who had to stay sober for all their life, you know, reading these scientific papers. I'm not trying to convince you by telling you that, right? I'm telling you what I did, okay? And I also, um, I also realized, Alexis, it's, it's still down to you. Have you got step one? Do you accept step one? Are you going to make that decision to give yourself completely to this simple program? You know, no one can make you do that. You're an adult now. You're not a kid. 
you have to make decisions in the face of your own uncertainty and you have to stick by them and uh, kind of seems like a bit of a damp squib of an ending but that's what it was and I'm still here now I've had a great 10 years there have been ups and downs actually I've had a great 2 years um, but I have had a great 2 years I really have had a great 2 years uh, so um, it's uh, <coughs> I, I, I haven't got much else to say, you know, it, it, it's real, it works, I'm still sober, I have some fantastic joy in my life, fantastic joy, and um, I'm going to stop there. Thanks for listening, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.